Hi, and welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church. My name is Michael Cromwell, and I have the joy of serving as one of the associate pastors here at RUMC. Thanks for joining us for our on-demand version of the sermon, which will be delivered later today. If you'd like to watch our services live, you can do so via our live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15. Notice our different worship times and our different hours that we have now. You'll also be able to see the entire worship service service on demand later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. We are so glad that you are with us today. We're thankful for your presence and we're thankful for your generosity and the different ways that you are helping to make RUMC a place of community and faith. Let's have a word of prayer before we hear our sermon. Gracious and loving God, we love you so much and we are grateful for this day and this day that we have to worship you. May the words that we are to hear, may they not only pierce our ears, but pierce our hearts as well, that we might be changed in different people because of what you have to say to us today. We thank you and we love you all in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now let's hear our sermon from today. This morning I'll be reading from the Gospel of John chapter 6 and I'll be reading verses 1 through 15 and this is what it says. After this, Jesus went across Lake Galilee or Lake Tiberias. Many people followed him because they saw the miracle he did to heal the sick. Jesus went up on a hill and sat down there with his followers. It was almost the time for the Jewish Passover feast. When Jesus looked up and saw a large crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, where can we buy enough bread for all these people to eat? Jesus asked Philip this question to test him because Jesus already knew what he planned to do. Philip answered, We would have to work a month to buy enough bread for each person to have only a little piece. Another one of his followers, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said, Here is a boy with five loaves of barley bread and two little fish, but that is not enough for so many people. Jesus said, Tell the people to sit down. This was a very grassy place, and about 5,000 men sat down there. Then Jesus took the loaves of bread, thanked God for them, and gave them to the people who were sitting there. He did the same with the fish, giving as much as the people wanted. When they had all had enough to eat, Jesus said to his followers, Gather the leftover pieces of fish and bread so that nothing is wasted. So they gathered up the pieces and filled 12 baskets with the pieces left from the five barley loaves. When the people saw this miracle that Jesus did, they said, He must truly be the prophet who is coming into the world. Jesus knew that the people planned to come and take him by force and make him their king. So he left and went into the hills alone. Pray with me. Lord, on this day, may we know your, your strength, your power. May we receive your spirit alive in us this day and know your presence it's in christ's name we pray amen read a story about a new preacher who moved to houston texas he uh, had been there a few weeks when he decided to take the bus into town he got on the bus, gave the bus driver his, his money, and the bus driver gave him back too much change. He didn't realize it until he sat down, and he, he looked down at his hand and realized he had 25 cents too much. And he thought, ah, what difference does it make? It's just 25 cents. And then he thought, the bus company has plenty enough money. They're never going to miss 25 cents. And when it came time for his stop, he got up to get off the bus, and then he turned around to the bus driver, and he said, you gave me too much change. Here's your quarter. That's when the bus driver said, I know, I did it on purpose. I've been thinking about finding a place to worship. And aren't you a new preacher in town? That's when the man realized it was a test. It was a test. Ooh, nobody likes tests. Nobody enjoys test. Nobody says, oh boy, I get tested one more time. But test times, well, they come. They come. And tests, tests aren't meant to show us up. They're, they're meant to let us know that there's a, an expectation on us. Jesus was a rabbi. 
And rabbi means teacher, and teachers give tests. And that's what it says right here in verse 6. Jesus asked Philip this question to test him. I don't know how much I like that. You know, we tend to think Jesus just went around giving everybody a hundred, no matter what their answers were, no matter what they said, just, just pouring out A's everywhere, A++ to everybody. But that's not what this says. It says he, he asked Philip to, to test him, to test him. Well, that's what I want to talk about this morning. A test, a test. And the first thing that I want to talk about is Philip's answer. Philip gave an answer, and that answer was the right answer, but it wasn't the right solution. What Philip did is Philip just, well, he gave up. He gave the right answer. Philip said we'd have to work a month to get enough for everybody to just have a little. But that wasn't the right solution, was it? So he gave up. So he gave up. Well, there's a temptation a temptation. That, that's what our eyes are most drawn to, what can't be done. The temptation is to see what's lacking, what we don't have, and what we can't do. That's the biggest temptation for all of us, to be drawn to what we can't do, to what's lacking, to what can't be done. Norman Vincent Peale told a story about a, a young man who, was, who came to him trying to, to figure out how to start a, a new business. And every time Dr. Peel made a suggestion, the man would say, well, I don't have money for that. And that's when Dr. Peel said, empty pockets never held anyone back, only empty heads and empty hearts. Well, now's the time that, in many ways, I believe we're being tested. We're being tested. And we have a tendency to look around and, well, see just what can't be done. This is a hard time. But it's not a time to, to give up. It's not a time to give in. It's a time to give it to Jesus because Jesus knows what it is to be tempted. Hebrews 2.18 says, For since he himself was tempted in that which he has suffered, he's able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. He's able to come to your aid and mine and give strength to you and me. Strength that, well, that we don't know we have until we look for it. Strength, the strength of His Holy Spirit that's available to all, to all who will receive Him. The Apostle Paul in Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now, Paul's not just sitting in a field of clover thinking up platitudes. Paul is sitting in jail. He knows what it's like to be shipwrecked. He knows what it's like to be beaten. And still, he says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Jesus Christ, the risen Christ, alive in you and me to give strength. Strength we don't have. Strength in the time of temptation. Strength. Strength that doesn't look for what we don't have, what we can't do, or what's lacking. A strength to look to Him. To look to Him. Philip. Philip, he gave up. But the second thing I want to talk about is verse 8. That Andrew didn't give up. Andrew gave hope. This is what it says in verse 8. Another one of his followers, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said, Here is a boy. That Andrew, Andrew noticed, he looked, and there among the 5,000, he saw a small boy. Now, who would notice a small boy with five loaves and two fish in a crowd of 5,000? But he looked, and he noticed, and he gave hope by bringing the boy to Jesus. He gave hope by bringing the boy to Jesus. Recently read a story about Bishop Fulton Sheen. I really don't know much at all about Fulton Sheen. I do know that in a long time ago he had the top radio program in the United States, the, the Catholic Hour. And when they transferred over to, to television in the 1950s, 
that show became the number one TV show in the United States. It even bumped comedian Jackie Gleason out of the number one spot. And the only thing that I knew about Bishop Fulton Sheen was one of my favorite quotes. He said, listening to Nunn's confession is like being stoned with popcorn. <laughs> well, yeah, he must have had an incredible sense of humor, but not only an incredible sense of humor, he must have been an incredibly sharp, smart person. In order to draw the attention of everyone in the, in the United States, of folks in the United States, for the number one radio program. He must have had a very strong personality, too, one that was spellbinding. I understand that um, on his radio show that even the, the announcers that were surrounding him were drawn so much into his show, sometimes they would forget a little bit about what they were doing, that one of the announcers at the end of the program said, next week's program, Bishop Sheen will be talking about thou house cast the bread upon the waters. And then he gave the sign off, you are listening to the National Bread Casting Company. <laughs> well, not too many folks have that kind of spellbinding personality that draws everybody in to what's being said. But we live in a a culture that elevates the celebrity, elevates the spellbinding personality, elevates the, the spellbinding sense of humor in the great mind. And, well, it'd be great to have that, that kind of humor, that kind of, of mind, or, or that kind of character. But I believe that God's not calling everyone to be a Bishop Sheen, a, a talker. That God's calling noticers and listeners to find that boy that no one would notice. To find that one that, that is among the many. And to bring them to Jesus. Not to have a Bishop Sheen kind of humor and, and mind and spellbinding character, but just the kind of humor and mind and character that, that God gave you to reach out to just the right person that God has for you to notice, to listen to, and to bring him to Jesus. We're living in a hard time right now. A time when people are feeling more isolated than ever before. And we don't have to have the kind of personality that, that, that reaches the world that you and I are called to have the mind of Christ that reaches out to one. Let them know where, where your help comes from. Let them know the verses that helped you to listen and to notice, and to give hope, to give hope, the hope of Jesus Christ. It's a test. It's a test. Well, Philip gave up. Andrew gave hope. And the third thing that I want to talk about this morning is the boy. It's the boy. It's the boy who gave what he had. So often we're tempted to think that well, money, money is what answers the, all our questions. Money is the hope of the world. Or that during an election season, we're led to believe that, well, government is the hope of the world. And if we keep fixated on money, if we keep fixated on government, we're going to miss the greatest gift that's ever been given to, to you and to me, the hope of the world. And his name is Jesus Christ. I began to notice in my first church out of seminary that God would show up in some of the most unlikely places. And then after my eyes got tuned to that, I began to notice more and more. I was uh, visiting a family, preparing for a funeral. And as I talked about the, or listened to them talk about the loss of their loved one, I noticed that there, back in the kitchen there was a woman in the church. And I didn't know this woman had any connection to the family at all. I could hear her back there, and she would stick her head out every once in a while. 
But then I noticed the second family I went to, to meet with them and listen to them talk about the loved one that, well, Jenny was at that house too. She was back in the kitchen doing some things that needed to be done. And it was at the third family. The third family, when I was at their house, I noticed Jenny was there as well. Well, afterwards, I pulled Jenny aside and I said, How is, what is your connection to all these families? I didn't know that you knew any of them. I mean, Jenny wasn't the kind of person that would just suck up all the air in the room, not by a long shot. She was very much a sweet person, but she was kind of a behind-the-scenes person. I, as far as I knew, she never taught any Sunday school class. She certainly never spoke from the pulpit or anything like that. And that's when Jenny told me this. She said, I read in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, where it talked about the gifts of the Spirit. And it says the gifts of the Spirit are apostles. It the gifts of the Spirit are prophets. And that God had given, given the gift of the Spirit of some teachers. And she said, and I knew that none of those were me. Then I read about the gifts of miracles and gifts of healing. And she said, and I knew that wasn't me. But then I read the gift of helps. Helps. She said, I knew that was the gift that God had given me. And I began to think about it, and I began to pray about it. And, and so there were people that every week I would call them just to, just to see how they were doing, just to let them know that they weren't alone and to listen to them a little bit. And she said, that started years ago. And, and then one person, when they had a loved one die, they, they gave me a call and asked for my help. Well, I was happy to do that. And then it was another person and then another, and then another. Well, who knew? Who knew? That a gift of the Holy Spirit is helps. That, that behind the scenes, doing what needs to be done where God leads. And I began to, my eyes began to be sensitive to that person out there around. And next church I served, there was a fellow that, was teaching girls fast pitch softball. He was teaching girls in our, our gym, about a half dozen girls, and I'd never seen fast pitch so girls fast pitch softball up close. Wow, those girls can just throw a blazing fast pitch. I don't know how anybody can hit it, and to hear the sound of it hitting the gloves, and here he had a half dozen of them that he would teach, and, a, and I would open the gym for him, and I struck up a conversation with him. I said, well, are you one of the coaches here in the area? I figured he was a high school coach or maybe a, a college coach and that he did this for a living. He giggled, and he said, no. He said, I, I work on the assembly line there at the plant in Doraville. I said, how did you get into this? He said, well, I began to teach my, my daughter fast pitch softball. And I learned everything I could about it so I could teach her. And then I realized I was pretty good at teaching girls fast pitch softball. He said, last year I taught 11 girls. And nine of them got full college scholarships. So often we look to money as the hope. We look to government as the hope. When Jesus Christ is the hope of the world and he's put inside you and me, just what it is, just what it is, this, this world, this world needs. The spirit of the, the risen Christ, alive and active in the world around us. It wasn't that long ago. There was a kid in the church. He was about ninth or 10th grade. And he began thinking about, what can I do to reach out and help other people? I mean, this is a kid. He's ninth, tenth grade. He said one of the things that he could do well, he could play with Legos. He knew all about Legos, and he loved to build Legos. He wasn't the, the kind of kid that would stand up in front of the youth group, certainly not the church, and, and, and talk to everybody. He, wasn't that, he was more of a behind-the-scenes kind of kid. He was a real sharp kid, but he... He thought it, he, if he took those Legos to the homeless shelter, 
Maybe he could strike up a relationship with some of the kids there in the homeless shelter and he could teach them math using Legos. That he could teach them science using Legos. That he could teach them history using Legos. And that's what he did. And then at the end of playing with the kids, teaching them, he'd give them the Legos to learn and play with on their own. So the, the church got enlisted in, in, in finding Legos around the house, anywhere we could. People were out looking at yard sales, some digging up into the, the old kid's toy chest to find Legos for this kid to, to take to the homeless shelters to play with the children. That year, the president gave this kid one of the points of light here in Georgia. Long before any president ever gave a point of light, Jesus Christ gave his Holy Spirit to just every everyday ordinary people like, like you and me. That his spirit, his power, his strength is available to all who will receive it. And that strength, that power, it's just what he uses here in this world to reach out and give hope. To give hope. This morning, I thought you should know. I thought you should know. Because there just might be a test. There just might be a test. Pray with me. Lord, Breathe the power of your Spirit on all who would receive you this day. All who would, would long to know the power of your forgiveness and the strength of your, your Spirit, your, your Holy Spirit alive in us. To reach into a world that needs to know you. We know that you use the everyday, ordinary people to reach out in powerful ways that we might give, give what we have. Our eyes are quickly drawn to what we don't have, quickly drawn to what we're lacking. But Lord, you have strength we don't have. Grant the power of your Spirit that we're able to, to see, to see your Spirit alive in us and reach out into a world that needs to know you. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thanks again for joining us today. Um, just a reminder, if you'd like to watch the entire worship service, you can do so via live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15 a.m. You can also view the service on demand a little bit later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. Also, if you have any prayer requests, we would love to hear about those. You can send those in to pray at rumc.com. Also, if you'd like to give of your tithes and your offerings, you can do that online as well. And that's at rumc.com slash giving. Uh, thanks again for joining us today and for honoring God with your presence. We hope and pray that you have a wonderful week and we look forward to seeing you again next week. My name's Tom Davis. I'm senior pastor here at Roswell United Methodist Church. Thank you for joining us this morning. We're a church that's a place of community and faith and we're a welcoming church. I hope that you experience that online, but not only online, my hope is that you experience it through our Facebook page. But not only that, once we meet together in person, we're at 814 Mimosa Boulevard and I hope you'll come and experience it in person. We're a welcoming church. We're a biblical church. And we're a compassionate church. It's a place of community and faith where we help people live a Christ-centered life. And my hope is that you'll come and be a part of it. Thank you for joining us.